Welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Julius Smetona. Perhaps uh, an issue which divides the American right wing more than any other is the question of conspiratorial influence behind the forces of communism and socialism. On the one extreme, we might have the John Birch Society, which believes there is a conscious, conscious intelligence directing uh, the forces of communism, often identified with major international banks, organizations such as the Trilateral Commission, the Council on Foreign Relations, and so on. On the other hand, in the American right, we have the view uh, enunciated by William F. Buckley, say, who says this is nonsense. Buckley himself says he's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He doesn't see an intelligence behind communism, socialism, and so on. He perhaps might just see naivete or self-interest. What do Catholics believe about secret societies? Do Catholics believe anything? Uh, our guest today is the Reverend Clarence Kelly. Father Kelly is the author of a book called Conspiracy Against God and Man. It was written with the aid of a distinguished French historian, Bernard Fay. Father Kelly, welcome to What Catholics Believe. It's my pleasure to be here, Julius. Father Kelly, perhaps uh, our audience already knows where you stand on this issue in that you wrote a book called Conspiracy Against God and Man. Right. Uh, what do Catholics believe about secret societies and conspiracies and the destruction of the West? Do they believe anything? Well, it's clear uh, since the early years of the 18th century that popes have warned over and over again that the forces of evil and collectivism have organized and that they carry on from generation to generation and that they intend to uh, wage uh, war on legitimate ecclesiastical and civil authority with the ultimate intention of establishing a kind of one world government and a one world uh, religion. Well, and this is this is remarkable because I, to my way of thinking and my understanding, I don't recall any Roman pontiff, or certainly my, in my lifetime and perhaps considerably further back than that, ever mentioning anything about such a force. Well, you should read more then. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, for example, uh, Pope Leo XIII wrote a wonderful encyclical on this uh, conspiratorial force called Humanum Janus. And in his encyclical, he makes it very clear that he believes there existed throughout Europe an organized force, a very brilliant, very powerful man, whose goal was the ultimate ruination of the Catholic Church and uh, the destruction of all legitimate civil authority and uh, the replacement of this authority with a universal uh, dictatorial government. That's Leo the Thirteenth. Uh, this, this sounds like a very solid reference to, for Catholics at least, uh, about the existence of such a force. But what happened? He said this in the 19th century and here we are a hundred years later. In, in 1884. Okay, so 1884, about a hundred, no, a little over a hundred years ago. What is yeah. the status today? Well, if anything, uh, it's certainly significantly worse because since the time of Leo the uh, Thirteenth, the external manifestations of this uh, movement have engulfed most of the world, especially since the establishment of Bolshevism in the Soviet Union. So, uh, in effect, things are immeasurably worse today than they were in 1884 when Pope Leo XIII wrote his encyclical on Masonry. But it's not only the testimony of the popes, it's testimony of some very famous and uh, respectable uh, individuals and statesmen who have spoken about publicly and uh, opposed this uh, conspiratorial force. For example, Benjamin Disraeli, the uh, 
the Prime Minister of England and also Winston Churchill spoke about it as well. <laughs> what exactly did Churchill or Disraeli say? Did they agree with your thesis that there is an organized movement for these forces? Well, it's not my thesis, okay. all right? Uh, in fact, the, the reason I wrote the book was not so much because I had this firm conviction and I had this mission to convince the world of the existence of this conspiracy. The reason I wrote the book is to show people that it is not absurd, that it is not a wild idea to say that the forces of socialism and communism are organized and that uh, those who control these forces are organized in a secret society. And uh, so what I did was I went and discovered what had been said about this by important people and I presented their testimony. So it's not a question of my thesis and my desire to convince people, it was rather uh, trying to get over the hurdle of the, uh, of the unthinkability of the, the notion of a conspiracy. That is, by the way, one of the few heresies in modern political thought. In, in modern political thought, you can think almost anything, but the one thing that is uh, heretical, that causes the politicians to, to go into a rage, so to speak, or to salivate, you know, like dogs responding to a bell, is the, the very notion of a conspiracy, that y you cannot reasonably bring it up. It cannot be the object of a rational conversation. Anyone who suggests it, anyone who brings it up, is automatically dismissed as being some type of uh, a strange person or, or an oddball. In other words, you are not allowed even to debate the question. Well, well let's get into some specifics in our times. Uh, this issue did come up, in fact, in, uh, if I recall, in 1980 in the New Hampshire primaries, where then-candidate Ronald Reagan, if my memory serves correct, accused George Bush of being a member of, if not the Council of Foreign Relations, a trilateral commission. And this kind of became an issue in New Hampshire, and people became concerned. Uh, what, what is a trilateral commission? Are these dangerous men? Uh, who are they? Well, uh, I would like to get back to okay. your other question and, uh, before we get into that because uh, it is in the other domain that we have the, the subject matter of the book. Okay. And, and that was, what specifically did some of these famous men okay. actually say about the conspiracy? And I will just read to you a couple of uh, relatively uh, short quotations to give you an idea about what these men actually did say. For example, Winston Churchill speaking in the House of Commons on November the 5th, 1919, said this about the Russian Revolution. He said, Lenin was sent into Russia in the same way that you might send a file containing a culture of typhoid or of cholera to be poured into the water supply of a great city. And it worked with amazing accuracy. No sooner did Lenin arrive then he began to beckon a finger here and a finger there to obscure persons in sheltered retreats in New York, in Glasgow, in Bern, and other countries. And he gathered together the leading spirits of a formidable sect, the most formidable sect in the world. With these spirits around him, he set to work with diamonical ability to tear to pieces every institution on which the Russian state depended. Russia was laid low. So here is someone of the stature of Winston Churchill declaring that Lenin was sent to Russia and Russia and in Russia called these influential and powerful figures from around the world uh, and that together they brought about the destruction and the ruination of the Russian state. Uh, here is another example, Benjamin Disraeli, who was, uh, you know, the... Prime Minister uh, of England. Uh, I believe the only, the first uh, or only Jewish Prime Minister of England. And this also was in the House of Commons on July the 14th, 1856. And on that occasion, this is what Benjamin Disraeli said. He said, there is in Italy a power which we seldom mention in this house 
I mean the secret societies. It is useless to deny, because it is impossible to conceal, that a great part of Europe, the whole of Italy and France, and a great portion of Germany, to say nothing of other countries, is covered with a network of these secret societies, just as the earth is now being covered with railroads. And then again, on September the 10th, 1876, he said this, the governments of the present day have to deal not merely with other governments, with emperors, kings, and ministers, but also with the secret societies which have everywhere their unscrupulous agents and can at the last moment upset all the government's plans. And finally, one more quotation from Pope Leo XIII, and this was in 1902 in an apostolic letter that he wrote, and this reconfirms what he wrote in the encyclical of 1878, 1884. He says, including er almost every nation in its immense grasp, it unites itself with other sects of which it is the real inspiration and the hidden motive power. It first attracts and then retains its associates by the bait of worldly advantage which it secures for them. It bends governments to its will, sometimes by promises, sometimes by threats. It has found its way into every class of society and forms an invisible and irresponsible power, an independent government, as it were, within the body of the lawful state. So there you have the testimony of such men as Churchill Disraeli and Leo XIII to the effect that indeed there exists this powerful conspiracy that uh, subjects the governments of the world to its whims. Well, let me ask... So it's not my theory. Yeah. Let me ask you then, Father, a question which perhaps would be a little closer to home to our audience. Uh, I think certainly this is a very powerful testimony. What are the uh, manifestations of this conspiracy, if you will, in this our age? How is it uh, operating, say, in the United States? Do the Americans have anything to fear from it? Well, there are two sides to, uh, to this conspiracy, and I suppose to every conspiracy. One is the organizational side, and the other is the ideological side. The organization is the instrument by which, let us say, evil men would seek to control governments or to control the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is to say, the, the direct and immediate instrument for that control. The ideological side, however, would be the ideas and the notions and the doctrines they would use to form the people so that they could more readily control them. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of the ideology, the ideology of uh, the conspiracy that Pope Leo XIII spoke about is, is basically from a... Uh, a political point of view, it is the ideology of collectivism. From a, a spiritual point of view, it is the so-called philosophy of pantheism uh, or naturalism. So there are two prongs to the ideology of the secret societies. One is to transform all religion into a natural religion. And uh, the other side, the political side, is to so organize society and the state that the state has absolute control over every facet of everyone's lives, everyone's life. And I, I think that as time goes on, it's clear that the role of government is increasing and the role of the individual is diminishing. For example, uh, about 37% of the gross national product in the United States is, is taken by governments and taxes, 37%. Yeah, that's so that, that's an indication of, uh, of an ever-expanding uh, government, and therefore there must be uh, the, the decrease in uh, personal liberties, true liberties. Right. Now, Father, I'd like to make a comment and direct a question in the uh, remark you earlier made. You identified the uh, two prongs of this, uh, this movement. One, on the religious one, this is naturalism. 
this idea that uh, merging all religions into a pantheistic expression. On the other one hand, the collectivism. Uh, one of the, the organizations which has often been associated and attacked as being part of this network, although not entirely secretive, is the so-called Trilateral Commission. Right. And among its members are people like David Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger, and, and it's, it's representatives of heads of state and important people from Europe, America, and Japan working for a, more of an international cooperation. Uh, interestingly enough, this is going to provide me an example of how the two, the spiritual and the social, interact. In 1983, the Trilateral Commission celebrated its 10th anniversary, and it had a full conference in Rome. In fact, at the Vatican. How do I know this? Because I saw the magazine called Trialogue, and they had a papal audience. John Paul II addressed this group. He praised them for their work on the unity of religion and for bringing about a more equal distribution of the wealth. Now, it seems to me that you're saying that these popes are attacking this conspiracy, and here we have a, a pontiff who, who welcomes them. What's your reaction to this? Well, I think uh, it's, uh, it's probably the political side of the, the, th the, the coin, which has on the other side the theological changes. The changes which have taken place in the church in the last 25 years from a doctrinal, moral, and liturgical point of view are changes which move in the direction of naturalism and ultimately pantheism. And, and so I suppose, I suppose, I really am not an expert on the Trilateral Commission, but I do suppose that that's the political side of it. With uh, the, these theological changes, there is a natural expression in the, the political domain. But I, knew, I do know from personal experience, uh, having been in uh, a seminary of, uh, of the new church, so to speak, for seven years before I went to a traditional seminary, I do know that indeed naturalism and pantheism uh, are at the root of the new doctrines. What link do you see then, uh, to bring it again closer to home, between, say, these organized forces and communism? I mean, communism is something a little more concrete. We could see these forces taking over countries, uh, imposing their own style of repression. And what is the link? The link is that uh, Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, not because he was an outraged idealist and saw the masses being uh, persecuted, but Karl Marx was hired by a secret society called the Communist League uh, in 1847, I believe. They hired him to write the Communist Manifesto. And uh, a year later, uh, they sort of went public. But uh, it's clear that uh, the forces of international communism have been aided and abetted by uh, the forces of the secret societies. Mm -hmm. And there are, there are various references from the popes about the relationship between communism and these secret societies. For example, Pope Pius XI made reference to these that. These occult forces, I believe, That's he referred correct, to yes. them. Now, there's uh, one thing you mentioned, this encyclical by Leo XIII, Humanum Janus. Uh, you didn't mention its uh, reasonable translation in English on Freemasonry. In other words, this, uh, this encyclical is very critical of Freemasonic lodges, and yet it seems that Freema you know, the Masonic lodges are a strong force in the United States. Many presidents have been Freemasons, for instance, uh, George Washington himself, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a Freemason, uh, the Duke of Kent is a Freemason, and yet it identifies this organization with the whole sinister movement, so to speak. What uh, You mentioned Freemasonry to a certain extent in your book. What are your uh, views on Freemasonry? Well, I think uh, Americans uh, have a different notion of what Freemasonry is than Europeans do. So if you talk about Freemasonry as being somehow associated with communism to American people, they're very shocked because many of them know Freemasons, and among the Freemasons they know, some of them are very patriotic Americans. However, if you mention Freemasonry in Europe, it's a different story because the European Freemasons are openly leftist and pro-communist. And uh, so Leo XIII in his encyclical says basically all of these movements 
uh, uh, have their center in Freemasonry. They, they come to it and they go out from it. Mm -hmm. What, uh, you know, Pope Leo XIII, and, uh, from him, the Church forbade Catholics to be Freemasons, not only in Europe, but in the United States as well. Yes. Why can't they be members in the United States if it's a patriotic organization? I didn't say it was patriotic. Okay. See, I said that the experience of most uh, Americans is that the Freemasons they know are basically ordinary common folk. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it is true that to some extent there is a difference between the nature of the, the mass membership Freemasonry in the United States and the more elitist Masonry in Europe. I am not saying that the upper uh, circles of American Freemasonry are, uh, are not indeed enemies of the church, because they are. There's no question that Freemasonry, which is a, a religion of naturalism, has as its supreme object of hate the Roman Catholic Church, and that is no doubt true in American Masonry as it is in European Masonry. I'm just saying that in American Masonry, it's kind of a, a, a more massive organization. It has far more members, and a much higher percentage of the members of American Masonic lodges have no idea really what Masonry is all about. Mm -hmm. In Europe it's different. It's a more elitist group. And those who are members uh, in Europe uh, would have a much more difficult time to claim that they don't know the true purposes of the lodges. Father, one thing I've noticed publicly, and perhaps you would agree or disagree, is that the general sentiment of the American public is, is that we really don't have that much to fear from communism anymore. Uh, when we criticize the communists, they'll say, well, look, are we all that good? Look what we do. We go around the third world, we oppress people. Uh, John Paul II came out in an encyclical recently, and he found both the East and the West equally to blame. What is your? What would your words of advice be to this uh, people who might have this view that don't view communism with any alarm and wouldn't even be concerned about secret societies promoting it? I, I think the reason they do it is because they are victims of uh, propaganda, the the propaganda of the press and of the television and of the radio. If if they would simply look at it uh, in this way. Let us say Gorbachev was a Nazi instead of uh, an international socialist. And let us say he glorified Adolf Hitler and he, he proclaimed there must be a new holocaust. Well, everybody would be up in arms. Uh, he wouldn't be able to come to the United States and we would break uh, diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. Well, there really is no difference between uh, international socialism and national socialism or Nazism. Uh, they're virtually the same system. One is a national socialism, the other is an international socialism. And as far as the ruthlessness and the, the brutality of the regime over which Gorbachev is the dictator, they are immeasurably more ruthless than the Nazis were. And so the American people have to, to take the blinders off, and they have to see that this Gorbachev is just a different kind of Nazi, mm -hmm. and that the Soviet Union is uh, one of the most ruthless and brutal regimes that has ever existed on the face of this earth, and uh, that the reason they are disposed to consider him a kind of nice guy is because they are brainwashed. You know, you're saying this uh, brainwashing has taken place, but then at the, the same time we have John Paul II, as I alluded to earlier, uh, come up with an encyclical which blames the social ills of the world equally, apparently, on the East, communism, and on the West, the capitalism in the United States, say. Uh, would you have uh, any comment on this encyclical? Have you... Well, first of all, there's no uh, pretension that that encyclical is an infallible uh, doctrinal teaching. No one makes that pretense. Mm -hmm. But clearly that's not true. It would be like comparing Jack the Ripper to, to the local cop on his beat who has to shoot a criminal robbing a store. Mm -hmm. And someone comes along and says, well, there's no difference between that cop and Jack the Ripper because that cop shot someone and killed him. Mm -hmm. It's absurd. It's manifestly absurd to compare uh, the United States to the Soviet Union. Right. 
That would be like comparing St. Francis of Assisi to Adolf Hitler. It's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Father, thank you very much for, for being with us and, and discussing secret societies. On behalf of what Catholics believe, I'm Julius Matona. I'll see you next week.